An additional 16,000 people crammed into tents on Spindle Top itself. Many of those who arrived in Spindle Top were from the rougher elements of society. It was said that half the whiskey consumed in Texas was drunk in Beaumont. Uh, gambling houses uh, were very popular. Uh, gambling was popular and so was fighting. And usually not a night went by that there weren't two or three murders. And one day, one morning, the people in Beaumont woke up and 16 bodies were dragged from the river, all with their throats slit. But it was not only the worst elements of society that came to Beaumont. The prostitutes, swindlers, and thieves who descended on East Texas mingled with some of America's wealthiest families. Members of the Mellon clan made frequent visits to check on their investment at Spindletop. When it became clear that James Guffey lacked skill as a manager, the Mellons got nervous. Recognizing the incredible value of their investment in the Texas wilderness, Andrew Mellon offered to sell the family's interest in Spindletop to Standard Oil. In one of the greatest errors in the company's history, Standard Oil rejected the offer. Andrew Mellon immediately sent his younger brother William to take over management from Guffey. Using the family's vast resources, William resolved to build an oil company that could compete with the colossus known as Standard. With Spindletop producing 3,000 barrels of oil in an hour and oil storage capacity limited, the Mellon's first challenge was getting the oil quickly to market. William then ordered construction of a 450-mile pipeline linking the Mellon oil fields to the family's refinery at Port Arthur on the Gulf Coast. The oil could now be transported to markets around the globe. The company William built was to become known throughout the world as Gulf Oil. But Gulf was not the only new company to emerge from the Spindletop Gusher. After hearing about the Spindletop find, a former Standard Oil Pipeline supervisor and wildcatter named Joe Culligan came to Beaumont and quickly organized the Texas Fuel Oil Company. By 1905, Culligan had acquired a number of production sites in the Beaumont area and had purchased four large oil tankers to transport his petroleum. He renamed his company Texaco. The size of this Spindletop discovery meant the whole oil industry was going to change. We were already moving in a direction away from the standard oil monopoly prior to the discovery of Spindletop, but Spindletop certainly accelerated that. When this field came in, all kinds of new oil companies developed out of it. And the two biggest ones that come directly out of Spindletop were Gulf Oil and Texaco. By 1910, Texas-based oil companies were starting to compete for markets throughout the country. The once invincible Standard Oil began to show cracks. In 1911, those cracks burst. On January 6th, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Standard Oil Trust was in violation of federal laws which prohibited the restraint of trade. Chief Justice Edward White ruled that Standard Oil would have to be broken up. The breakup of Standard Oil transformed the oil industry in very short order uh, from uh, uh, essentially a one company industry, uh, at least in the United States, to one of the most competitive industries around. Mobil, Chevron, Exxon were all Standard Oil Company breakup. Uh, you've got Shell. BP, who are not, Texaco, who are not, but you're looking at the majority of the privately owned uh, oil companies in the world are, were uh, Standard Oil spin-offs. The new companies that resulted from Standard's breakup and those that emerged from the Texas oil fields would fiercely compete with each other in the decades to come. Their competition was to transform the very nature of American life.
In the decades following the breakup of Standard Oil, America became more dependent than ever on petroleum. Even during the Great Depression, the number of gas-powered cars on the nation's roads continued to grow. And during both world wars, American victory was assured by the nation's domination of world oil supplies. But it was during the decades following World War II that oil consumption reached its apex. As America entered the 1950s, the nation's reliance on oil had grown from a necessity to an addiction. It was an addiction driven by the automobile. America's love affair with the car was consummated. Between 1945 and 1950, the number of vehicles on America's roads climbed from 26 million to 40 million. At the uh, end of World War II, uh, uh, American life is transformed uh, and transformed largely by the automobile. Uh, the automobile makes it possible for you to live a long way from your job and to commute to work. Americans are not only buying the house in the suburbs, they're buying a car. In some cases, if they're wealthy enough, they buy two. The other thing that happens is Americans want bigger and bigger cars. The 1950s and 60s are the heyday of what some people call the muscle cars, the V8s, the 400-plus horsepower. Um, and these, of course, are not very fuel efficient. And so our consumption of gasoline and motor oil skyrockets in this period. For American oil companies, competition was more intense than ever. Dozens of corporate giants battled for the consumer's dollar. In addition to the companies that emerged from standards breakup and those that blossomed out of the spindle top strike, other corporations were making their presence felt in the marketplace. International concerns like British Petroleum were increasingly competitive in the U.S. And Phillips Petroleum had sprung up from the rich oil patch of Oklahoma to become a major player. With 20 companies all selling essentially the same product at the same price, image and service became the hallmarks of the post-war oil industry. You can trust your car to the man who wears a star. He's the man best qualified to take care of your car at every Texaco station. Clean across the nation. You can trust your car to the man who wears a star. But the good times of the 50s and early 60s would not last forever. Prosperity brought with it its own problems. America's oil fields were proving unable to keep up with demand. By the late 1960s, the nation relied on imported oil to keep the economy strong. Then, in the early 1970s, oil-dependent America's nightmares came true. Thirteen oil-producing countries in the Middle East and South America formed OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. In 1973, OPEC placed an oil embargo on the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel against the Arab states in the Yom Kippur War. The American economy went into a tailspin as gas shortages gripped the nation. Throughout the late 70s and into the 80s, America was beset by economic problems relating to its reliance on imported oil. Then, Iraq invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. 